Tonight on The Breakdown, we look at round one of Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa and we get the lowdown from referee Ben O'Keefe. Chief Superstar Damien McKenzie joins the show ahead of their first up battle against the Highlanders. And we catch up with the All Blacks head coach Ian Foster for his thoughts on a new season. Kia ora katoa, hello and welcome back to The Breakdown. Super Rugby Aotearoa, Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa, round one ended with both the Crusaders and Blues flexing their collective muscle. And then at 9pm Saturday night, the landscape changed, the Blues will spend their bye week on the road for at least seven days due to a level three lockdown in Auckland. And our ability to adapt will be challenged once again. We did though get through our first weekend of a competition. We have plenty to talk about. Stephen Bates is in, Mills Muliaina joins us in. Batesy, I do understand that the support crew, the support players of the Blues have headed to Hamilton. They've all been tested. They've uh, stayed there. The Blues that were in Wellington, they've managed to find their way to Hamilton and now they're going to base themselves there. But these are challenging times and how they use their seven days in, during this bye week is going to be very, very interesting. Yeah, and I guess it's probably not this week so much because this week they've only had one week and then a bye. But now they're going to have to, they're going to have back to back to back weeks, you know what I mean? And that's when, unfortunately, you could say it's a good time to have this flare up in Auckland because they've got the buy no game. But also that's probably going to become a little bit more testing when they play their fourth game in a row and they've been training that whole time. So, but their management will look after it, I'm sure. I think they'll handle it fine. Mills, you handle lockdowns brilliantly, don't you? <laughs> I mean, how have you coped in the first day back into it? You know, kids at home. We did a Zoom with you yesterday. You had everyone all over the top of you. You were fighting through, scrapping through the kids. I mean, it's just. This, is this going to be the new normal for us, really? Well, it really has to be, really, until you know we, we find out really what's going on. We've been through it before. Uh, it's a challenging time, but um, you know, hey, we've still got sport. And I think when you look at the, the way the Blues adapted straight after the game, you know, the fact that they didn't come home and they said, well, let, let's stay here just in case. And we'll continue to change the Crusaders, Batesy, already making a change for this weekend. Now, not playing Saturday, pushing back to Sunday afternoon at 4.35 kickoff in the hope of going down to level one and getting fans. A good idea? Oh, a wonderful idea, you know, and both for, for the Canes to buy into it as well, because they don't need to buy into it. So we've got to work together and hopefully we go to level one, hopefully that they get some crowd there and hopefully they get a bit of revenue because it's not a bottomless pit of money. You know what I mean? It's, it does hurt their bottom line when they've got no fans at the ground. Look, it's going to be a challenge as well down in Hamilton, the fact they're not going to have fans on Friday night. Difficult for the teams, but once again, they will have to adapt. We've got a tipping competition here at Sky, and it's not too late for you to join. If you missed last weekend, don't worry, get onto the website. The average results of week one, you'll get those, which means you'll be ahead of me and to be ahead of Mills, go to tipping.sky.co.nz. This is how it stands right now. The Sky Tipping Breakdown Leaderboard. Pure and simple, Stephen Bates is on top. What are you looking at there? The overall points? Well, he managed to get a couple of the selections right and who won and who scored the number of tries and his differential. The margin balance is your tiebreaker. And there I am sitting just above Sir John Kerwin. Mills is disappointed because he got both winners and nothing else. And nothing else. So the reality is, are you disappointed, I know? I am. I didn't read the finer details of this competition. Now that I know, hey, it's Mate, only for an outside one. back, you should know the number of tries teams are going to get. You know, it's game on. But I tell you what, you've got an opportunity. Make sure you get on the website and you get into it and take it on. Right, let's talk about the first contest. It was down in Dunedin. The Highlanders taking on the Crusaders, a great southern derby. Good way to start the competition. Plenty of passion, Batesy. Yeah, it was good, and the hucker started it off, so that was a wonderful piece too. Everyone loves a hucker, so, and there's plenty of fire from both sides, and they came at it right from minute one, didn't they? The Crusaders were the Crusaders. The defence mills was outstanding. The fact they were able to go back onto their scrum, their line-out mall defence was immaculate through the course of the game. Apparently, it's been three years since they've conceded a, a mall and driving try, so they set the standard once again. Is this just more of the same from them? Oh, it is. It's, it's the hallmark of their, whole, their game, their pillars, what they sort of go to. And then it's not bad when you've got someone like Richie Moore no, that, that controls those big moments. So you not only got to win those, those defensive moments, basically, like this, but then once you get that opportunity, to, to exit and get out, they've almost flipped it the other way around. You know, they're in the other 22 and now they're applying pressure, you know, within, you know, minutes. Yeah, and they're probably the, the real defining factor, wasn't it? Like, how many malls they defended. Gave away a fair few penalties, but they did defend them. Uh, 
um, and then they get their one opportunity down in the Highlanders thing, and they, they drive over and they score a mall try. Pretty demoralising for the Highlanders. Yeah, but I think on the back of their performance, they always go back to their defence, for me, and the fact of creating opportunities for them. From time to time, though, and it happened in the pre-season, and they conceded two more yellow cards, Millsy, is that an error they'll be very much concerned about right now? I think so, and I think once you get to... You know, round two, the referees we would, would have monitored it very well. You mentioned pre-season, they gave away a lot of uh, a lot of penalties, a lot of yellow cards as well. Again, in, in, in the weekend, ill discipline. So, yeah, if, if you know, Scotty Robinson wants to come away with things, I think he'll be pointing out that because they don't want to give back-to-back penalties. They don't want to put themselves under pressure to have to always rely on that on what you talked about, the defensive effort. Yeah, great intent though in terms of the physicality they brought. Would there be an element of disappointment, Batesy, if you're inside the Highlanders' cap, the fact that you were able to control some territory and able to control position and you weren't able to find a way to break that down? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, as I said, they, that mall try would be quite demoralising for them, I think. They, they just were in the game for periods of time, but just with the amount of position, the amount of territory, they just couldn't quite find that switch. They just couldn't break any of them, any defensively around the mall or even through the midfield. They looked very good when they got ball a little bit wider and started link a few players, but that, around that tram line and stuff, they just couldn't break down the defence. Mills, there were some players, though, and you always talk individuals who were, I suppose, impressive in their first... 80 minutes, and Severo Reese for me was one of those, had a really challenging 2020. We saw some glimpses on Friday night. There is something about him for 2021. Oh, gee, he was active, wasn't he? He came off his wing, he wanted to get the ball in hand. You know, that, that kick that he did on, the, on that inside, look, even that, like that little wee goose step to just give, buy himself a bit more time and get over that, you know, that, uh, the line um, a few times. But, man, he was very impressive. This is the kick I was talking to you about. I mean, to execute that, and get back inside, and it's absolutely outstanding. And the competition around that position on the outside backs for the next level, I think last year he found out, Batesy, pretty quickly that you need to continue to perform and perform at a high level to make sure people see and understand what impact you can have on the game. And, and I think that we know that when he touches the ball, defensively can hit hard too. I think we know that he can do those things, but it just you can't do those things once or twice a game. You've got to do those things 7, 8, 10, 12 times, and then that's what he did on the weekend. He was heavily involved, and when he's involved, stuff happens around him. Yeah, try to put a shot on Liam Squire. Yeah, I saw Put that. a shot on Liam Squire, <laughs> of all people. It was nice to see him back out on the field. Uh, nice for the Highlanders, knowing the fact he's going to get better and better over time. Let's talk quickly about the Highlanders, though. The fact that they've really really did struggle at set-piece time. The fact they weren't able to establish their driving more ball. Also, at scrum time, they were under pressure. And that's going to be an issue when they come up maybe against the likes of the Crusaders and Blues. But will they have an opportunity maybe to play a little bit more rugby under less pressure against perhaps maybe the Chiefs and Hurricanes? Oh, I think they will. I mean, they've got a relatively inexperienced pack, haven't they? When you look at the locks as well, I mean, we spoke to, to Brownie about it last week, you know, um, having to bring Evans in and go just to try and, you know, steal that up a bit in terms of the inexperience. But I think they'll learn a lot from that from that game. They had a lot of opportunities. I think that's perhaps where they'll be very disappointed. You know, uh, they didn't quite, you know, execute the way they wanted to. And when you, you come back and talk about, you know, the, you know, your pillars of your game, I mean, that's that's massive to you know to constantly be under pressure on your own scrums, but then be in the 22 baits here and, and, and you know you know lose those sort of lineouts as well. That's I mean you talk about demoralising. It, it absolutely was. Well, and I think there was just a little point there in the game when, as you talk about the lineouts, they changed the hookers. They made a couple of substitutions, and then unfortunately for them, their lineout fell away, and then they just the Crusaders exited out of that. So whether that's a uh, thing because they just haven't trained that much together and they're a bit clunky, but there was a period there when the when the substitutions came on it just got a bit clunky for the for the Highlanders unfortunately and probably another area given what the Blues were able to achieve last season that they have developed this depth and and the same thing with the Crusaders they've always got that so when you're coming up against those teams who clearly on the weekend set a bar they set a standard and it was impressive well the Crusaders they return home and they play the Hurricanes now of course this Sunday and last year it was one of the great games of the season and a game that's uh, expect so much of. I'm looking forward to it. Hurricanes have won their last three. And Jack Goodhue is such an integral part. Beautiful pass to Moanga. And the little number 10 scores. Against La Malfi. Umanga Jensen sends it wide and wears horses. That was outstanding. The back goes south here and bounces Hall out of the road. Ball presented nicely. Reese got it back. Flung it wide to Bridge. Bridge kicks in. Oh my goodness! Jeez, <laughs> now they're going to half 
opportunity with Hurson, and he gets two. Where's Hurson? As they spin it back this near side, gives it away to Umanga Jensen, and he's got it on the line. This may well be the most important of all. And never much doubt about that. Moanga, Moanga slipping through. Now he looks to link up. Reese has got a score in the corner. And the unbeaten streak is over here in Christchurch. The Hurricanes have got the win. And the only loss for the Crusaders last, se last season in Sky Super Rugby, Aotearoa. So we look at this and the campaign's starting for them. Uh, you talk about what's happening though for the Hurricanes. And that's where the focus is here. They're going to go down to Christchurch. They played against the Blues on the weekend. The Hurricanes were in it and they scrapped and they hung in their mills. But it didn't look as though they were the same threat that they have been in the past. Yeah, they looked scrappy. Yeah, they, they dug deep, uh, you know, when they were you know, 14, in, well, man down, really, and they, they got back into it. You know, Geordie Barrett with his kicking game as well. They, they just didn't look as fluent as, you know, what, what, what they did at the back end of that season. You know, almost uh, the same sort of start as they had last year uh, during the you know, Mystic Super Rugby. Um, yeah, they need to find something different, I think. You know, they've got some X-factor players there, but it just looked really messy. It was a really error-ridden game. First 40 minutes, not a lot going on. You were sort of knock-ons, turnovers, mistakes, which led to a lot of set pieces, Batesy. Look, you're involved with the Blues, and you look at their performance on the weekend. How satisfied would they and where they would be with how they performed in the scenario they were in? Well, I think, I think first and foremost, they'll be wrapped because they won. Yep. You know what I mean? And that's the main thing at the end of the day in a high-performance environment. And I think, and you probably alluded to it, I think maybe they're, they're a little bit clunky in the first half, but you've got to remember they've only had their All Blacks back for a short while. They've had a, a lockdown before this lockdown as well. Um, so, and I think in the second half, you saw a bit more of what the Blues can offer. So the first half, they got a few cobwebs out. In the second half, they performed better. I think if you look at the highlight from them, from my point of view, would be the fact that they were put under pressure they were winning, then they were losing, and blue sides in the past have perhaps faded. They didn't fade, they got stuck in, and at the end of the day, came away with a result. And what you say there to me is the fact that they have learnt a lot from last season, Mills. The fact that Bowden Barrett was obviously a big part of their campaign last year for a number of reasons, and he wasn't at his sparkling best on the field, but it appeared to me there was a composure to know how to go ahead and win a game. Well, it's not bad when you've got you know massive forward pack that can actually you know yeah. deliver that, isn't it? I mean, composure and confidence, and that's been built over the last few years. You know, they, I mean, look at their their rolling more. You know, when was the last time you've seen a blue side actually dominate? You know, that much. Um, you know, before. So when you look at guys that, that are up front, you know, the the big what well, the All Black front row plus the bench. You know, and then you look at uh, Patrick Tupolotu, who's an outstanding leader. Complement that with with your back, you know, with your Lucys. They've got a pretty handy forward pack there. All right, two tries, Batesy, off turnovers from the opposition, off strong defence, forcing them into errors, coming forward with the physicality we're talking about. Are there similarities between them and the Crusaders in terms of what they've got available to them, in terms of that depth in their forward pack and the way they're using their defence? Yeah, there's certainly similarities, as you mentioned, like if you, we mentioned at the top of the show. If you just look at the, the, the front rowers that both sides have got, there's, very, there's similarities between them both, that's for sure. And to the back end of the game, they really got some pay out of their front rowers, I believe. But uh, away from the forward pack, I'd just like to mention, we mentioned Bodie's not there, but I'd like to mention Teddy Black. How good was he? Like, he was really, really good on the weekend, eh? He really was. Yeah, uh, controlled the game, did exactly what they needed to do. I thought Sam Nock did a good job at halfback as well. That's where the question marks have always been. So starting to push forward, Stephen Petrofeta at the well as well. At the back for the Mills, the fact if he can stay healthy. healthy. Is there some subtleties to their game? We probably didn't see enough of Caleb Clark and Rico Iwani. The potential for them to get better, there's, there's a lot of it. Oh, we didn't see enough, but we've seen glimpses. Glimpse. You know, I mean, when you, when you look at the, the, the start that uh, um, you know Clark had, when he sort of broke through a few gaps, and then he sort of made it. You know, later on in the game, you know, you know that's that's you know enthusiasm really when you try to take on the, uh, the guys and three guys in front of him. But when you got X Factor like that, you know, Iwani, he's just he's moulding into a nice centre. I'm liking what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing there. You know, his experience, his maturity as well. But when you also talk about you know all Teddy Black and the way he's run the game but you look at the guys like Harry Plummer who's been there for a number of years so you know having guys like that that are, that are got stability that can get you out of the you know out of trouble with your with your uh, their boot I mean it's it's coming together for the for the Blues it's taken a few years and Leon McDonald is really building a, a very good side are you is it the Blues year oh, that's what I'm hearing from you that's what I'm hearing from you is that 
Well, the Chiefs haven't played yet, have they? Oh, that's all of a sudden. We'll Chiefs wait to see on Friday. Yet. There'll be another discussion on um, Monday. Well, of course, it all kicked off on Friday night um, down in Dunedin. Of course, big, massive responsibility for our refereeing crew. We've got a great team of them. It was Ben O'Keefe who had the responsibility, and he's volunteered to come on the show onto the breakdown. Ben, great to have you with us. Um, a number of things, obviously, you want to talk about from the weekend. Uh, you refused to tell me how your golf went today, so I won't even go there. And you've blocked me online from finding out, which is disappointing. I, th I thought you were bigger than that. But let's start with the fact. Give me, give me your impression, just quickly, of, of weekend one for you guys as a team, because I know you met this morning. Yeah, cool, guys. Um, yeah, we, we met this morning um, to go over the weekend. We have a review every Monday. Um, firstly, you know, I'd like to be part of the competition with the back up and running um, after what we had last year and, you know, six weeks off. Um, you know, it was great to be back. And I think we saw some exciting games and, you know, an exciting start to what's going to be you know, pretty awesome competition um, down here in New Zealand for the rest of the year. So um, just like the players, I think the referees were fizzing. Um, and um, yeah, as you said, you know, there's some stuff that we, we took from the weekend to, to, to learn from, to grow from. And, um, you know, that'll, that'll lead into next weekend and the, the games after. Ben, it's uh, Batesy here, mate. I'll just ask you a couple of questions around, like, what people that, that I've been talking to are talking about, mate, and just see if we can get some clarification on it. And um, the first one you'll know is the, is the Joe Moody thing. Is that, is that the standard, or what's your thoughts afterwards looking back on that situation? Yeah, look, my phone was going nuts um, straight afterwards as well. So um, we, had, we had our review um, today, and you know, that was one of the big talking points. And, you know, how, how did we manage that at the time and what was the right outcome? So, look, we worked out, um, you know, going through the process that, you know, Joe Moody should have been yellow carded for um, striking to the face. And, um, you know, that's that's really the standard that we want to be able to set, that if you're going to be doing something deliberate like that off the ball, um, you know, you should be yellow carded for that. So, I mean, I was the referee at the time and um, at the moment, you know, I made a call based on what I what I felt was, was correct for that situation of, look, we're going to, going to give it a penalty. I'm going to talk to both men, both captains, and we're going to, you know, calm the game down and, and crack on and play some rugby. But, you know, that's the benefit of reviews when we sit down and look at the process. And, you know, the outcome of that is that, look, you should have had um, 10 minutes in the bin. So as a group of referees, we, 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 all, we all learn from that. And then, you know, that's, that's the standard. So if we see that um, later in the competition, um, they'll be very lucky if they're not going to be, be yellow carded. Ben, speaking of yellow cards, I mean, what's your, what's the process in terms of you know the penalty penalties in the uh, in the 22? Is it you know do you get a consecutive penalty? You know, sometimes uh, for different things. At what stage do you actually give a guy a yellow card based on that? Yeah, look, I mean, referees, we don't we don't want to have to dish out cards. We don't want to be the centre of attention in the game. You know, like our focus is for the players to play a good game of rugby, showcase their skills, and you know, hopefully we can just um, work out in the background, but. You know, when there are teams or when there's, there's penalties that are building up, especially within the 22, um, for, you know, slowing the game down, for closing down space, when they're taking away opportunities to see great tries, and, you know, that's what we all want to watch. Um, that's when we have to step in. So our process really is um, if we get multiple uh, penalties within the 22, let's say um, we get two in a row, you know, that's when we're starting to think, OK, do we need to yellow card the next one? Do we give the team the, the benefit of a warning? I mean, it really depends on what decisions they were. So um, in that first game, we had um, uh, two penalties against uh, the Crusaders, a warning, and the next one was a yellow card. So um, on, the, on the fourth one that they had in a row. And, you know, it doesn't always need to be that there has to be a few in a row, a few mounting penalties. But, you know, if there's one that's cynical or deliberate, that happens right on the goal line so a player doesn't roll away, or it's a big line break and the player dies over the top of a ruck to kill the ball, you know, you could go straight to a yellow card. So... Um, you know, there's a few processes there. You can have a, a yellow card straight away, or you could have, you know, two or three penalties. Um, you know, discuss that with the team. Um, give the cap captain the benefit of the doubt if they can change the behaviour. Um, great, you know, then we get the game going. But if they don't, then that's going to be a yellow card. And you know, whether you give a yellow card in the first minute, um, you know, it shouldn't change if that same action happens ten minutes later or or 30 minutes later as well. Uh, look, there's a lot of innovation that's been brought into the game, and one of those is, of course, the um, uh, captain's referral, which we haven't quite seen come to fruition yet. But in terms of looking back at footage, and it happened down in Dunedin, the Highlanders were disallowed a try after a, a knock-on at a ruck. And now, this is probably a process one as well. Just so people are clear, is you can go back now on the case of any situation around a try if there's a certain... Um, uh, if you suspect something across any number of phases, right? So you can go and look, and this is something that Mike Fraser, I think, the assistant referee, saw and needed another look at. Yes, yeah, so there's been a really um, 
like a TMO protocol and process that's been in place for a few years now. What we've done in Super Rugby Aotearoa is we've actually included the captain's referral to be able to assist with that. Um, but it doesn't change what we've been doing as a, as a team of four on the field. So after every try has been scored, we have a process that clicks in in the background where um, the, myself, the referee and the two assistants, we're walking back towards the kicker and watching the replay, making sure there's nothing really clear that we're missing um, on the big screen. And then the TMO is working pretty hard upstairs with his um, 12 angles to make sure that there's, there's no small detail that we've missed. Now, often, you know, tries, we, we can clear them pretty quickly, but um, that situation you're talking about, Goldie, down in Dunedin. So um, the assistant referee on that far side saw, you know, some movement, a bobble at the bottom of the rock. Now, it wasn't enough to call, to make a live call. Um, so often that happens in the game. You know, we've actually, we, we, we're not sure, so we don't guess. Um, but if it does lead to a try, that's when we are able to use the, um, the TMO system. And I think even um, Scott Barrett came over to us to ask what we were checking. When we said, look, we're going to check for a potential knock-on at that ruck, um, he said, great, because I think, you know, we might have had our first captain's referral if we weren't looking for that. Um, so, yeah, we had, we had the outcome there where we saw um, there was a, a small knock-on, but a knock-on's a knock-on uh, at that bottom of the ruck. And um, unfortunately, we had to disallow probably what would have been a, a really fantastic Islander try. Ben, a, uh, another piece of clarification from me, mate. The uh, Geordie Barrett conversion, I'll admit, I was at home thinking that went over. Can you can you, can you clear that one up for us as well, please? Yeah, look, I think I um, I fell for probably the camera angle as well, but um, you know we've got uh, Jimmy Dolman right under the post. So as assistant referees, um, we both right under the post, so we can look straight up um, when the ball's coming towards one of our posts. Um, we actually call mine, um, so we can tell the other assistant referee, oh, I'm going to make this call because it's not going down the middle. And when we look up, if the, if the ball's on the inside, obviously we can raise our flag. If it's on the outside, it's missed. But if it goes directly over the post, which it did in this situation, um, then uh, it's, a, it's a no conversion as well. But you know, we weren't helped by the, the camera angles that, that um, came through after the game. Yeah, and, and you guys provided us with some great footage we just put up of the fact you've given us the lines, you've given us the angles, and like you say, it's all a matter of timing. And like you say, the only person probably who knows that is... The referee who's standing under the post at the time. And so just to credit you guys, you got it 100% right there. Look, it's challenging. There's no doubt the first couple of weeks uh, of any competition. And we saw it last year, the fact that, yep, there was some high penalty counts. But for you guys, is your indication that, yes, the coaches and the players are well and truly understanding what you're trying to do and we're going to slowly but surely see them adapt and make your job maybe that little bit easier? Yeah, look, we always want to make our, you know, our job to be easy. But um, look, the great thing that's, that's happened over the last two years especially is that there's been real collaboration between um, the coaches, players and referees uh, within the competition in New Zealand. And we saw that last year when there were quite a few changes. And I think, you know, if we're watching rugby around the world, they're sort of catching up to what we started last year. And then this year with the key focus areas and the game innovations, um, you know, we've really already set the standards. So we're just trying to build from that foundation. So... Look, there were a lot of penalties um, in round one. I think that happens because, you know, it's round one. Um, referees are adjusting, players are adjusting. But as we saw last year, that, that penalty count comes down pretty quickly as, um, uh, you know, referees get more accurate and players actually uh, understand what, we, what we're trying to achieve together. And then, you know, by the time um, you get to the end of the competition, like we did last year, we had, you know, really good games of rugby with, with, pen with penalty counts that no one's ever really talking about because, you know, some games will have high penalty counts, some games will have low penalty counts. Um, but I think, you know, this year what you'll see is a, a faster adaptation because um, the teams have all done it last year and, you know, there's no major changes that we're trying to do in terms of space and tackle. It's um, still the same message and I think, you know, everyone's, everyone's bought into that really well. Well, I think we had a great positive start to the uh, competition over the weekend. Well done. Friend me on golf.co.nz, please. I want to see what you're hitting from day to day. But thanks very much for joining us, making yourself available. and look forward to chatting to you soon. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Well, after the break, we talk all things Chiefs, Chiefs and we catch up with Damien McKenzie. But first, gents, this week's trivia question, why does co-captain Brad Weber celebrate tries with a fins-up salute? Stay with us. Chiefs. Kia ora and welcome back. Yes, the Chiefs open up their campaign at home to the Highlanders. No crowds at Waikato Stadium. Clayton McMillan is in charge. Before the break, we asked you why Brad Weber, co-captain of the Chiefs, did the fins up 
when he scored a try. Any idea, gents? Is that a fins up? I thought it was like it's a, a rooster. rooster. It's a rooster. It's not a rooster. It's a rooster. He played for the Dunedin Sharks in Dunedin. Oh, okay. oh, when he was down there playing for Otago. Oh, That's what he did. And once you do one thing down in Otago, you never forget it. You never forget it. All right, let's talk about the Chiefs. Their game, their first game of the season coming up on Friday. Batesy, what do you think they learnt after the first weekend they have to do on the weekend up against the Highlanders? Remembering they had a couple of great contests against them last year. Yeah, well, the good thing about them, they've got Bryn Gatlin on their side this year. So <laughs> that, that might That's help handy. them out. But I, They'll obviously see, because they've got a good scrum as well. So they will look towards their scrum and try and pick it apart a little bit like the Crusaders. And, and they'll realise that they might be a little bit off the pace being uh, the only team that didn't play last weekend. So they'll have to hit the ground running. 0-8. That's last year. How do they put that behind the mills? What do they do early to say, you know what, we parked that one to bed? Other than maybe win the game, but what have they got to show this week? Oh, they've got to first and foremost park it. I mean, you've got to remember, before yeah, we went to Super Rugby Aotearoa, they were in very good form. You know, they just lost their whale and Perhaps it came down to tactics and, and, and the structure of the competition. They, they, they sort of lost a couple early and then, you know, momentum sort of, um, you know, dropped a little bit. But I, I think... Tactically, you know, they held onto the ball a lot last year. They, were, you know, I mean, they they, they challenged the line. They they um they attacked the, the longer. So, a balance of their game in terms of their, their kicking and how they and how they do that. I think they'll look very much into the you know tactically how they play the first round. The intensity for me is going to be the big one because you know they've they've gone from you know two weeks ago where they played that game of three halves to them you know having scenarios. I mean, it's a it's a massive drop in intensity to then come back up again. And there's some serious issues with their lineouts in that game as well. The fact their execution. Who for you, Batesy, out of their squad can take a step up, which elevates their entire performance. Well, you know, go for two, like, you talk about their locks. Their locks are very, very young, aren't they? They've got very young locks. Real potential in the locks, but they are really young. But the guy I'm quite looking forward to playing, I just hope he gets through a whole season, is Atu Moli. He's been an all-black, but he's been out for 12, 18 months. He hasn't really had a decent crack. But if he gets going, he is some footballer. So I'm quite excited at, about him hopefully staying fit and hopefully getting a bit of game time. We're going to talk to Damian McKenzie in a moment, Mills, and we're going to ask him, but where would you like to see him play in regards to this squad and, and maybe give him the best opportunity to perform? Well, we would all, um, well, 10, because that's where he's been at <laughs> during pre-season, right? I mean, it's perhaps somewhere um, you know, they need a little bit more stability. Yeah, Trask was, was very good last year, very young and, and what he but the problem was he didn't have that consistency in terms of game time, you know, week in, week out. So McKenzie probably fits that mould in terms of coming in, that experience that he's, that he's had there and being able to run the cutter. I mean, you talk about his kicking game, his ability to be able to, to, to find, you know, um, space as well, but Trask, for me, you know, he's, he's, he's a solid kid, but he just needs that sort of consistency being out there. But perhaps they need it to sort of set up first with Damian McKenzie. Big shoes to fill, though, was Aaron Cruden, who was the man who was doing the job for them last year, adding to their environment. The Chiefs, they continue to introduce and develop new talent as well as anyone in this competition. And halfback Xavier Rowe is a player with a high ceiling. Pano is like a, a pretty small town with maybe, maybe under 1,000 locals. The thing I like about Pano is it's small, everyone knows everyone and you can kind of drift off when we were younger kind of thing, go to the skate parks with our, with our little brother and big brother, so we've kind of got a lot of freedom here. We're at my mum's surf shop, she's had this for maybe six or seven years, spent a lot of time here um, with surf lessons and that and working in here. So I was about 15, teaching people how to surf, done a qual uh, qualification as well to actually be able to do it by myself. It's good being at the beach, especially living in Hamilton, um, coming back to a little town like Paunui and getting out on the water. It's kind of a, like I said before, a bit of freedom. I was about 13 when I moved to Hamilton Boys. Pretty good school. I was in um, the, boarding, the boarding house. Rugby's obviously a big thing in, in, at Hamilton Boys. We've got a good reputation for having good rugby teams and always doing well every year. Oh, 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 oh the there he goes. Over your road. All the way. To the After I left school, um, I got an opportunity to go down and play for um, Taranaki Maritain Cup team and I was there for about uh, two years until I uh, came back up to Waikato. Row, gap, Xavier Row, try! What a start! Yeah, driving to, I can't remember which game it was, but I remember going with my Nana and Popper from Thames to Hamilton. Yeah, that's probably my earliest memory of watching the Chiefs, but I remember um, watching, when I was at high school, watching Liam Messam, Craig Clark and that, when they went back-to-back, -back, which was um, pretty special, so... And the Chiefs go back-to-back. -back. Yeah, no, I'm excited to get into it. I'm excited to get on the field in front of the Chiefs fans. Coming to Chiefs games when I was younger, got photos um, at home and that that I've got. 
Um, so yeah, it's pretty special. It's a team I've always wanted to play for. Um, team with a lot of um, rich history in that, so yeah, no, it's pr pretty exciting. Yeah, some sort of young player coming into an environment. This is not a young player anymore. Well, sort of young, Damien McKenzie. But he's been around the traps. He knows what it's all about. And we all know that smile. But, Damien, run me quickly through uh, Xavier Rowe, what you've liked about him coming to your environment. Of course, you've got plenty of halfbacks down there. But uh, another small man for you to hang out with. <laughs> yeah, another the small man to add to the, the few of us. So, no, he's a good kid. He's had a, played a little bit of um, Waikato with him. And he uh, obviously showed how good he went through that um, competition. And then, yeah, his pre-season, he's been going really well and, and training really really hard. So um, I'm sure he's in for a big year. Damien, mate, I'll ask you right off the bat, where are the Chiefs' strengths this year? What, what are you, you going to show us round, uh, round two for, you, for everyone else, round one for you guys on Friday? Uh, yeah, we've got plenty of um, exciting new talent and... Uh, you know, we're quite a young squad and it brings a lot of energy. And um, obviously, uh, we've got a pretty solid solid forward pack. Um, uh, Lucy's really strong. And then obviously, you've got Wee Spud running the, at nine there with the composition with Trip and, and Xavier as well. So, um, yeah, I think we've got some guys of. And then sort of their fourth, fifth France um, for us. So, um, yeah, we've got a good all around team and, and a lot of youth and energy. So, we're pretty excited to get into it this week. Damo, you have got a good all-round team, but I'm just not going to beat around the bush, mate. Where are you playing this year? 10 or 15? Come on, mate. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I've just um, been trying a little bit at 10, a little bit at 15 as well, but um, probably early on, just look to, to, to start off at 15 and, and uh, whether I move into 10 later in the game, we'll just see what happens. Obviously, we've got some... Some great young talent at 10. Um, like you said before, brings up our way this year, so it's quite nice. And, and then obviously our back three too. We've got some pretty special players back there too. So, um, yeah, looking for an exciting season and wherever I'm to play, I'll probably best foot forward eh? uh, What did you make of the first weekend? The fact you get the benefit of watching the, the other four teams go at it and the way that they've played and the, and the, the context of, of the competition and whether or not some of these new interpretations and laws are coming in. Did you see anything different or did it just look like another season of a really difficult Super Rugby? Yeah, it was some pretty grouse games over the weekend and uh, oh, just like any New Zealand derby, it's... Um, Physical, fast, exciting to watch, and um, yeah, nothing too different. Obviously, you've got the goal line dropouts now, which um, might set up for a few more attacking kicks. But um, yeah, it's it's pretty much similar to last year. Just beat each other up and <laughs> um, play some fast, fast running rugby. So um, yeah, I don't. Too, uh, I'm not 15, mate. I don't see too much traffic. Well, hopefully, <laughs> the boys up front are doing a fair bit of work to keep me. Uh, out of, uh, out of the job, yeah. Oh, man, out of my own heart. Uh, absolutely, Batesy. I, I love it when fullbacks talk like that. <laughs> David, I want to ask you, mate, you've had three three new head coaches in three years. Is that is that an advantage because you've had uh, plenty of opportunities to see a different way of doing things? And uh, are you settled in the... Is your, the environment quite settled at the moment? Yeah, I've obviously had a, a, a change with Clayton coming in and I've been really impressed with how he's gone and um, he's... he's, um, he's no gray, gray area with him. He, when he talks, everyone listens, and um, you know he's done a great job so far in this preseason. So um, obviously he's done a great job with the, the Maldives in the past and with Bay Plenty. So um, yeah, he's yeah I've been really impressed with him and excited to um, play the season now under under his realm. I mean, I mean your your offloading game is one of your strengths. I mean, can we but can we see you know you guys kicking it a, a bit more this year? Yeah, I think, like you said before, it's, I guess it's just a balance of, um, you know, that middle area of the field. When it's when it's not on to play, we, we look to it, maybe kick and um, defend and, and try to get the ball back that way. So, um, yeah, for us, it's a fine balance. Obviously, like I said, we've got a lot of youth and a lot of energy that uh, like to play with the ball in hand. So, for us, it's just about working out a good balance uh, between that running and kicking game. Uh, Damien, I must ask you the fact, of course, we've got that um, frustrating news, the fact that there's going to be no fans on Friday night uh, in Hamilton. So for you guys, have you talked about preparing for that and the fact that you may have to adapt over the course of this season if things do go in and out, say, of lockdown? We know the Blues are now in your neck of the woods spending the next seven days to train. Is that something as a group you have talked about or will you have to talk about during this week? Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess um, this morning, not to have, on the other hand, we're pretty grateful that we can still be able to play rugby and be uh, home to play. And um, obviously, to have a crowd's nice as well. But yeah, I guess you've got to be prepared for, for the worst and, um, you know, to have a plan in place. And uh, whether we need to do that or not, we're, we're not sure yet. But um, yeah, we're just excited to be able to still be playing rugby and hopefully putting on a bit of, sh- bit of a show and a bit of entertainment for the people at home. All right, we know what this contest that played out last year and they were two absolute crackers. And, you know, like it went right down to the wire in both games. Mate, we're looking forward to seeing you and the Chiefs team back out there. We know you're going to have a successful season and we look forward to, mate, seeing some action. Whether it's a 10 or 15, we'll know you'll, uh, you'll show us plenty. Thanks, mate. Champions. Thanks, lads. I can't wait um, to see the impact he can have. I'd like to see him more at 10, but he's indicated the fact that 15 and then coming in late in the game, I don't have an issue with that either, Mills, the fact that at least he's going to be influential and they'll give him an opportunity to use those players around him. I think their whole back line is, is pretty critical. Oh, he's such a threat, though, isn't he? But the, the, the other factor, too, we're talking about you know, Trask, but also Gatlin, you know, yeah. what he sort of brings, you know, his ability to be able to um, control the game, you know, you know, put the ball in front of him. So that was there. He, is, he is, is massive in terms of the, the way their back line will go. And you mentioned it, the, the, you know, Gatlin last year having that drop goal and yeah. to, to beat them. I mean, there were, there were the things for me that they weren't that far away last season, you know, like I think in four of the eight games they were within 10 points and closer with m- moments to go. So you look at that, they're a side that really, if they get some momentum, they can be very difficult to beat. Oh yeah, 100%. And it, it's, we've mentioned it plenty of times before. It's only the small details in this competition yeah. and Gatlin started the rot for the Chiefs last year playing for the Islanders. But one thing I do want if someone like Gatlin who controls they've got so many rock stars outside Gatlin if he does play a 10, just controls the game, controls the game, sets it up makes the other team a little bit tired, he goes to the pine and McKenzie comes into 10, I personally think that's not a bad combination, Trask's alright too though I suppose. And some sort of loose forward combination you think about when you've got Boshier you've got uh, Jacobson in the back, you've also you've got Sam Kane, I mean you look at that Mills to me, across the board though, the loose forwards across this whole competition, but they can be an absolute menace. Yeah and they Bring, they bring that sort of physicality, don't they? And they, uh, you know, the extra little d- different parts of their game. You know, Kane, you know, he's equally good over the ball, but he also can, you know, hurt people in uh, defence. Bosch here, if you give him that split second to get in there, he'll, he'll get in and he'll hunt some ball. And Jacobson, wow, man, you know, some of his, you know, dominating runs and just the, his engine as well. So they complement each other really well, which is probably what you need when you've got, a, you know, you know, two young guys in front of him um, in terms of, you know, Tupovai and, and also Akoi. So, I mean, you know, that, that's, that, that sort of solid sort of um, back three in terms of the Lucy is outstanding. And they'll be looking at the season and going, the Hollanders at home will be a game they will want to win if they want to be a contender later on in the season. We are heading to a break, but don't go anywhere. Coming up, All Black coach Ian Foster beams in from the Waikato. But first, let's look back at the game in Dunedin where the Highlanders performed a haka that honoured their past and present. get you up close and personal at the game. The domestic season, it has commenced at home, the international programme. Well, it may be a little less clear, but for all back coach Ian Foster, the preparation, it never ends. We welcome Fozzie onto the breakdown for the first time in 2021. Great to have you with us, Fozzie. All right, 2020 is behind you now, your first season in charge with the All Blacks. What did it highlight for you and have some of your priorities maybe changed as you go into the season? Yeah, good evening, gentlemen. Welcome to the new rugby year. It's exciting, isn't it? Um, you know, I think this year is, 
you know, I mean, whilst it was a, a full year last year, it was only six tests, but it's um, certainly, I think, going into this year, I mean, with the with COVID and not really having a hundred percent certainty, it, what it does do is it just focuses us on the here and now and and get maximising what we can get out of Super Rugby. I think it's the key, and I think for us, probably two areas emerged out of last year that we're really looking at in, in Super Rugby to, to try and see a little bit of a difference and lift in our game. One is the just the overall skill level. I just felt that um, it's an area of, of massive advantage for the All Blacks and, and New Zealand rugby, but the particularly the catch pass and the running lines is something that we've probably just relaxed a little bit, I, I think. And so we've really put that challenge out to players about, about their skill sets and just creating world-class habits each week. And the second thing is um, is discipline. You know, I think if you look at our, our campaign, when we, when we had teams that niggled us and took us off task, we, we struggled. And, and yet when we mastered that, we were fine. And I think... You know, us, us learning as a nation that, that teams want to stop us playing. They'll do a whole lot of different things and we've got to be better than that. So the whole discipline aspect uh, is going to be really key for us. And, you know, one that uh, probably wouldn't start that well in round one. <laughs> Fozzie, on that, uh, on that comment, mate, I just want to ask you. So you sit there in the stand in Dunedin. What, can you give us a little bit of insight of what you're looking for? Do you, do you spend 10 minutes looking at a player or two or just looking at the broad sort of spectrum? What, what are you looking at this early on in the season? Yeah, good question, Basie. It, it really differs. I mean, obviously, there's myself, Foxy, and Plum. Plum was at, at Wellington and... At this stage of the year, we're really looking just to see, you know, just general patterns and flow and just trying to see if we can understand what what both teams are trying to do on the park so that we can assess what the individual's role in that is. And, you know, down in Dunedin, there was, um, there was plenty, of, plenty of names for us to look at, you know, particularly interested to, you know, to welcome back Liam Squire into the park and to see how he went. So, so it was neat to see him back and, and that's, that's a good sign for the Highlanders. But Primarily looking at overall patterns, particularly for this first round, and then we'll come together and, and narrow down some individual watching after that. Positions, Fozzie. I mean, Bowden Barrett's you know over in Japan at the moment. You look at Richie Mwanga, he streaks above the rest. And when you look at the weekend, relatively inexperienced, uh, the other tens. Is that a concern to you? Yeah, look, it's not it's not ideal that you know in the last few years we've probably had one All Black ten playing regularly um and so there's you know we clearly we we uh, you know Bodie's expressed that he really wants to go back to 10 and put his hand up for them and and we're we're right in behind that move it doesn't preclude the fact that we're still interested in him at 15 I guess but it's um you know we know he's a, a world-class 10 he just needs time in the saddle so you know he's he's maximizing his opportunity over in Japan and getting that but um, it, it, it is good to see him back getting some consistent time there. And I think, you know, you've just spoken to Damien and he went across to, well, in our squad last year as our third 10 and, you know, as, as a more as a utility, but I'm a, a big believer that he can play 10 and the skill sets he shows at 15 are transferable. So it'll be interesting to see how he goes. Through the course of Super Rugby then, uh, Fozzie, what, what are the conversations you might have with the franchises when you start talking about players and getting the understanding maybe mm. of patterns of play? Is that, is that quite an open book in terms of maybe getting the best development out of the guys you may be looking at? Yeah, look, it's, you know, we've, we've already done a, a bit of a visit with, as a coaching group around each franchise and just meeting with the All Black players and their coaches just to get alignment on, on the skill sets and the key focuses for each player. And that's, that's really important that the player doesn't get any mixed messages in that space. And, and from now on, you know, we've got the ability to, you know, we've still got the ability to have a chat to the player occasionally, but, you know, primarily all, most of our feedback now is, is really by talking to their coaches, having a look at what they do. And, you know, we've got some great people in our franchises who are, working with the players and and as long as we can keep alignment with them on particularly the skill levels that that we're that we want and, and how they're going about that that that's a key for us so there'll be regular visits from the different coaches from our our trainers and, and medical staff and and a lot of that's done on a need basis so um there, there's plenty of talk going on Fozzie, I won't hold you to this one, but we obviously know it's a COVID world at the moment. But last year you got six tests, six tests in. What is the schedule for all goes to plan for the All Blacks this year? 
Yeah, well, we've got um, the the plan at the moment is is fifteen test matches, which I'm I'm not sure the All Blacks have ever played fifteen test matches, so it's pretty big, and and you know, so we we're, we're in the process of working our way through that, and and clearly, you know, there'll be there'll be checkpoints as we go along based on borders, and because um, obviously the the border opening is going to be key for us, I guess, later in the year, so. We'll, we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on that, keeping an eye on plans. And, you know, like, I mean, ultimately there will be some other plans happen that, that if borders get shut down, but there is a desire to play a lot of rugby and, you know, who knows, you know, we might even end up with a whole lot of countries in one country playing a, a, little, a, a mini World Cup of, of COVID. Of course, that who knows what's going to happen. But, I mean, I do know that we've got a big year planned. In, in that regard, then, if you're looking at that year, is Super Rugby Aotearoa, critical in terms of preparing you for that when you realistically when you're going to have a big group of players you'll probably have to engage in the all-black environment yeah well it's super rugby has always been vital for all black rugby and it's always been a great um uh preparation point so so nothing changes from that side but you know it's probably become a um even more vital component now because of the uncertainty of of the international game. So, yep, it is, it is important, you know, and, um, you know, what we are getting is we, we've got to make sure we've got players that are really resilient. You know, we, we know whatever the challenges are, you look at the blues now that their normal prep has been changed and, and players just have to ride along and, and I'm sure there'll be the same sort of adjustments later in the year. So we're, we're really looking for players who can, who can deal with what's, what's in front of us right now. And, and not get too caught up in the changes that that will occur, and um, and they'll, they'll they'll probably be more ahead of us. But we need players who really just want to knuckle down, deal with the challenges, and get on and play a great game of rugby. And, and let's let's talk about that. If there's one thing you'd love to see in regards to Super Rugby Aotearoa, in terms of the game, not individuals, but in terms of the way the game is played, what would excite you the most as the All Black coach? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think if you uh, if I looked at what, what what we learned and you go back to your first question, I, I'd really like to see our skills skill set go up and up and up, and and have players really really master the, the the basics parts of the game because you know the whole shapes and patterns of games. Everyone's got a slightly different picture of that, but what we can control is is the basics of our game, and and I think that's key. And and Super Rugby is great for that because there's a lot of pressure on there's you know, there's a lot of players who know players and so there's always a bit of mate versus mate going on and, and the ability for players to get distracted. So how they hold their attention in that space and coupled with that, like I said earlier, is us being able to get really disciplined in how we go about it. And, and what I mean by discipline, it's not just doing something stupid, it's just not not getting distracted from our, from our core job. And, you know, we're... We do see that at Super Rugby where guys needle each other and because they know each other so well and there's a lot of that going on and it's a great place for us to practice how to stay in control, stay focused and just go and do your job. And you've got a big job in front of you and we, we're grateful you joined us on the breakdown this early in the season to give us a bit of an insight where you're at and we look forward to you catching up with you a little bit later on in the year. Thanks very much, Fozzie. 15 tests, you've got plenty to prepare for. <laughs> Thanks, mate. That's right. Thanks, guys. 15 tests. Don't know if it's been done before. Uh, challenging Mills, but reality is a lot of things he would have learnt in 2020. And I'd imagine there's a lot of players have gone away with some really clear messages about how they need to get back to make an impact at the next level. Well, I think also the fact that they lost to Argentina, I think that, that would have given them a big you know, opportunity to be able to talk about those things. He's highlighted it's something that's been you know, very much, a, uh, I suppose, a dominant bit of our game, and that's our skill set. You know? So you know, where, do, where do they need to go in there? They would have sort of broken that, that all down and made sure they went out to the, the toughest part is, is, is the pressure, the pressure to be able to do those little skill sets, you know, um, and, and be able to uh, affect them. That's what's going to be the key. Actually, because I'll throw to you then, Bates, the fact that wasn't that our secret for so long is our ability to execute our skills under pressure? Was that what 
Ian Foster's talking about. That's what set us apart from a number of other teams. Yeah, and I, and I think he touched on it there as well. He said, like, within within reason, patterns, attacking patterns and defensive patterns are very, very similar, you know what I mean, across the board. There's slight, light, slight little chink, uh, chinks in every little system, but it's your ability to catch pass under pressure and have those sharp little skills, and we do have athletes in this country, and other, other, other countries are catching up with those athletes, but we have genuine athletes. You look at the loose forwards you've named, our outside backs, we have genuine athletes, and if we can get their skill set with their athletic ability, we still have an edge, I believe. Well, he's given you an insight on what you should be looking for as you watch games, and some of you get the opportunity to watch that live if you go to the game. And here on The Breakdown, we are giving away six tickets to every Super Rugby game. Unfortunately, we cannot for this Friday in Hamilton, given to COVID levels. But they've pushed the game out in Christchurch and hopeful to get down to level one. This is the Whanganga family. They were at Sky Stadium in Wellington having a great old time. You make sure you get an opportunity to go and go to the breakdown at sky.co.nz to be in to win. If it is not level one in Christchurch, we'll push those tickets out to the next game there in Christchurch. We're just about there. Just quickly, who have you got this weekend? Just quickly. Crusaders and the Chiefs. The Crusaders exactly. and the Chiefs? Exactly the same. Exactly the same? Crusaders and Highlanders. I'm going to stay loyal right to the very end. It has been great to be with you once again. We're hopeful that we get an opportunity to be with you from Christchurch next Monday night. Matiwa. In a nutshell, can you just let us know what 2020 was like for you? Uh, in a nutshell. Um... <laughs> Bit of a testing year in, in many ways. You were talking to our player. I was talking because he had a massive goal. Oh, can you believe it? Couldn't quite find our groove. So it's frustrating to have, be doing all the right things off the field and, and not quite having them correlate on. But um, yeah, mark my words, we'll be a hell of a lot better next year. I don't want no more. It's not like we're not giving ourselves chances to win the game. Chiefs, Alain Malo, don't stop him. I truly believe we'd be better for having gone through that rough period.